get the um, the, the union endorsement? How can we stick it up to the healthcare workers? Yes, sir. I, I'm kind of confused about that. You got the union endorsement, but you're not sticking up for the healthcare workers. That's in the union. Person, sir. How many of you guys are going to lose your jobs? Freedom, not force. You're losing your jobs. Freedom, not force. 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 I was at the ER the other day. Guess how long I waited there and I didn't get seen. Yes. Seven fucking hours I waited there. And I didn't get seen. You know why? Because healthcare workers are being fired for no fucking reason. Hey, we're sick of it. Hey, hey, no, 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 Freedom not force. 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 Hey, Don Gregory, why don't you come on Don Gregory, why don't you come on speak? Hey, Officer, may I speak? You, I listened to you for a second, so please. You came over and you wanted us to leave. And I graciously understand you want us to go to the sidewalk. I totally agree. That's all public Correct. We will give you several invitations. We would like to try to come in and make you a certain Correct. So, 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 so it's the fence line. I'm trying to understand what it is. I'm trying to understand what it is. All right, show us where we can be. You think it's fun? Hey, yo, yo. It's not stop. funny. Stop. It's not funny. Stop. 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 Yeah, but you know what? How long until they come for you? How long until you get forced to take the jab? In the country already without the mandate. If you think this means that you're going to stay set on allowing religious I'm glad they think it's funny. I'm glad they think it's real funny. How long until they force you to get the vaccine and you lose your job for not getting something that you don't believe in? Right now it's just healthcare workers. How long is that going to be until they start going for everybody? Truckers. Everyone. Think about that. Yeah. 
I gotta tell you, as if someone in the press, no, he doesn't show up too much. Making choices. Well, I mean, off the record, the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce is running this. It's an amazing event. This is the very first time she misses an event from there. She's been no, she actually, she actually didn't come to the ramp event either. But that's okay. Tina Peterson's ramp event. For the chamber? Oh, I know Nelly. Sorry, 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 sorry. 
Sorry, might just uh, squeeze for that. No worries.
about the list that I have to, to, to thank, but I, I need to interject that uh, we are so proud to have the representatives from the Pawtucket School Committee um, here tonight. We're very proud to be um, giving them uh, recognition uh, for the incredible great work that they, they, they did, uh, and including minority participation in all of their projects. Um, from the city government, school committee, building committee, uh, you represent what can be accomplished when you have people that really care in leadership positions. We thank you very much. Uh, with that, I want to turn it over to, to Oscar. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Governor, Treasurer, Major, Major, of the, uh, Assistant Director of the OEO. Thank you very much for being here with us. Um, I am Oscar Mejia, the President of the Rhode Island Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and I want to say that the Hispanic Chamber has been working so hard in the last five years to create opportunities, to promote business and to create opportunities. And we are creating this opportunity just for you, for the Latino contractor. We firmly believe that the construction industry has a great and brilliant future with us, with the Latino Chamber, with the Latino contractors. So this is about this event is for you, for the Latino contractor. We are creating opportunities with the support of the Governor McKee, of the Treasurer Magaziner, of the Authority of the City, the Mayor Elorza Providence, Mayor uh, from Potoket, but also working with different state agencies, the Office of Diversity, Equity and Opportunities, the Secretary um, Secretary of State Office Business Services with a uh, Business Development Office of the City of Providence and a lot of organizations because we want to work together and we want to work together to create opportunities for you. We are providing technical assistance, we are providing training, we are providing the connection that you as a Latino contractors need to grow your business. So this event is for you. This event will be the opportunity to hear our official elected, to hear what are the plans of the government for the next year, to hear what the agencies can do for us. So please take this opportunity to change information, to interchange your business card, to present your business because we need to take advantage of these opportunities. We will continue working for you. We will continue providing all the help that you need. The phone number of the chamber is always open for all of you. We can uh, reach us through the uh, web page. We use intense uh, social media uh, posts, so please stay connected that we are here to help all of you. Okay, so thank you for being here, and um, please, I want to uh, recognize uh, Mr. Stefan Pryor, the Secretary of Commerce, if you please um, sit in, in, in the panel. Um, but I also want to recognize uh, the Councilwoman Lamis Barga from Cranton. Thank you for being here. Uh, Representative Karen Alzate, the Potocket and of course the authorities of the school committee, um, Mr. Vice Chairman Roberto Moreno, Joan Bonolo, the school committee, and Jay Charbonneau for the school committee. We have a surprise for them today um, because it's about to recognize what the organ organizations and state agencies are doing for our Latino business community. Remember, we are the future. We are here not asking, not stealing. We are here working hard to contribute with the community, with the city, with the state, and with the country. So thank you for being here. And now I want to um, give the opportunity to Mr. Governor Dan Mackey. Thank you.
it's a, it's a kind of a tricky mic. I'm going to try to do the best I can. Uh, but Oscar, thank you so much for your leadership uh, with the Hispanic Chamber. Uh, many of us have seen the un unbelievable work that you have been able to do with Louis and other board members to really create this uh, this chamber uh, that uh, is representative of, of many of our businesses in the state of Rhode Island and working with you as Lieutenant Governor and during the early stages of the COVID uh, to work to get millions of dollars out to the small businesses in the state of Rhode Island. And then again, as Governor, one of the first things I did was put out about $30 million to help the small businesses and ask them played a real leading role with others to get into the Hispanic community uh, to make sure that that word got out. And I think we had over across the state of Rhode Island over 4,000 small businesses that received $5,000 during the time that they needed. And I think that's really important. I just reflect a little bit about where we were in March. Uh, Rhode Island was one of the highest infected uh, COVID-19 states in the country. It, was, it had one of the highest death rates in the country, and it had one of the lowest vaccination rates in the country. Last week, we had the lowest death rate in the country per capita. We had the second lowest infected state in the country, and we had the fourth highest vaccinated state in the country. So that has to do with leadership that is throughout all our communities that is now put us in a spot where we can really maximize our economy. And today, we are number one in reopening our economy in the entire Northeast, and we're number five in the country in terms of reopening our economy. So what does that mean for us? What it means is this great economic opportunity for everybody in the state. And the Hispanic business community is a very important integral part about our, not just recovery, but our expansion of the economy for all the families who live in the state and all the workers that live in the state. So we have, so it's not any secret that I'm really pushing very hard to get some of the uh, federal funds out on the street. Uh, and inside of that effort, we've carved out a plan that not only gets money for the 39 cities and towns in ways that really matter, housing issues, child care issues, and business issues, small business in particular, but we also know that coming out of the pandemic, that many of our businesses have uh, lagged behind, whether in capital or whether in terms of employment, in terms of work. We have identified clearly that even uh, with the, the department that Tomasa Villanueva was heading up for us, that uh, there's really a real need to hit the numbers that state law says that certain amount of percentages of work need to go to minority-owned businesses, women-owned businesses. And we are very intentional about making that happen. If Tomas gets to speak, I'm sure he will tell, him what, tell everybody here what I've tasked him to do and how he's very willing to do this. And it should not take long. It's just a simple math. I was asked by a couple of people, well, Jesus is going to take a long time. I said, no, this is not going to take a long time to follow the rules to get this percentage of work out of state contracts to minority-owned businesses and also women-owned businesses. We know that it's critical to our, uh, to our state's recovery. Last thing I would say, too, is that um, our workforce and the contractors now exceed where we were, where we were pre-pandemic. Uh, that's remarkable, but it's a reflection that Rhode Island is making investments in uh, construction, in road improvements, in different types of facilities that are going to benefit all the businesses, small business, all the families in the state, including the Hispanic businesses under the leadership uh, that we'll provide as governor, and Tomas will provide along with Stephen Pryor, uh, and, and then the leadership is coming from the Hispanic Chamber. So that's a that's a that's not that's a commitment that we will keep and we'll keep that that promise to everybody that's here so that we continue to build this economy. Last I would say, um, you know, I'm happy to be here with the treasurer, along with the mayor's province and also the mayor of Pawtucket uh, in your hometown, uh, and always happy to be here. Um, so we will keep this work going. 
Uh, and then the last piece, because I know the school committee members here tonight, we are going to make sure that we do everything we can. Those lower infection rates, those higher vaccination rates, those lower death rates, and by the way, we were one of the, the, the least hospitalized uh, states in the country over the last several weeks as well. So, but that's allowed us to open the economy, and it's going to allow us to open our schools safely. And we're going to do everything we can to get make sure our young students are in the classroom and learning just as they are now, and uh, as well as our universities. Because our universities, we have many, many Hispanic uh, of our people in our state that go to our ten our universities. And last thing I'll say, because I, I, I know I'm going to over, overdo my ego here a little bit, but the, the fact of the matter is that our universities have stepped up in an incredible way. And I want to make sure they're recognized. Eleven universities, I met with them in April. They wanted to get all the students back in the classroom. I said, get them vaccinated and I'll support that. They came back collectively as a group and said, we'll vaccinate our students. We have 60,000 kids that live in Rhode Island that go to our universities. Another 40 to 70,000, depending on the travel with COVID, that come from out of state and out of the country that attend our universities. And we know that about 95% of those students are vaccinated. What does that mean for us? It allows us to open the economy. It allows us to open our schools. So I thank you so much for the invitation to be here tonight, Oscar. I'll give the microphone back to you. And um, we'll, we'll uh, let the people yell and scream outside. But vaccinating our healthcare workers is very important uh, because healthcare workers need to be healthy to keep us healthy. So we'll, I'm sure it's all going to work out. And we're very happy that people are kind of bringing a highlight to that effort that the hospital support, as well as our, our, day, our um, healthcare facilities, our nursing homes, they all ask me to do that. I'm happy to stand with them to keep us all safe in the state of Rhode Island. Oscar, right back at you. Thank you. But it is not enough. We 
we have to do more. We have loan programs in place that are getting the job done. Doris Blanchard is here. Please raise your hand, Doris. Doris is an amazing liaison. She heads up all of our small business programs. She's the director at Commerce. Doris has pioneered a small business loan program. It's the first the state has had in memory, so probably has never had, funded by state finances, where more than half of our recipients are minority businesses or women-owned businesses, and we're in the tens of millions of dollars going out the door now. And now when you see that under the governor and with the partnership of this General Assembly and with leaders like Mayor Palacina in Johnston, when we do a deal to build the largest building that Rhode Island has ever seen, the Amazon complex that's going to get built in Johnston, 3.8 million square feet, we ask the company as one of its community contributions to fund our small business loan program. So Latino businesses, black businesses, women-owned businesses, and small businesses across Rhode Island can benefit. So this is the kind of ecosystem we have to create to maintain and even enhance the momentum so that New York and Massachusetts, we hope they do well, we do not wish them poorly, but if they're gonna, they're gonna stay in the 40s, we wanna keep rising on that list and maintain a top position. Uh, most importantly tonight, what I wanna talk about is for the contractors active in the Hispanic Chamber and contractors looking to get a break, to break into the construction industry, I want to talk to you about a program called Supply RI. If you haven't already heard of it or plugged into it, Supply RI is a program that has existed only in the past few years. It is really unique in the country where major anchor contractors and employers, universities, medical centers, hospitals, and big private sector companies sign up, and they sign up with Doris Blanchard. And when they sign up, they say, we're going to help position small, minority, women-owned, and Rhode Island-based contractors for the procurements that we have. And in the construction line of work, in the construction business, you should know that, uh, is Gilbane in? Yes. Is Shawmut in? Yes. Is Brown in? Yes. Is RISD in? get the picture. They are the anchors who are anchoring the program, searching for Rhode Island vendors, especially small minority vendors, to provide the work. Now we have to keep working at through our loan programs and through technical assistance positioning you to win. Uh, but we have 15 total anchors. We have routinely convened in-person and virtual networking sessions. Um, and we offer other forms of technical assistance and access to capital to get the job done. Um, for example, Johnny Leva, if you all know Johnny in the construction fields of Heroica Construction, broke through and got his first contract with the Rhode Island School of Design, RISD, to do their main undergraduate art gallery, the one that they use for their undergraduate students on campus. He got the contract to do that job. And, and that's, a, that's now a gallery that features group exhibitions and is like a, a centerpiece of their campus on Prospect Street. And our own homegrown contractor got the job to work on that project through Supply Ride. Just one example. But what I want you to know is it's not only possible, it's happening. So uh, the reason it happens is because Doris Blanchard works it every single day. Raise your hand one more time, Doris. Please contact Doris if you're, if you're thinking, I've heard of it, but I haven't attended yet, or I'm not sure I'm on the list, or I'm just plain sure I'm not on the list. Please get on the supplier I list. And Oscar Mejias, thank you for continuing to provide leadership that enables us to get all this work done. So uh, on behalf of the McKee administration and from the Commerce team, thank you very, very much. I want to nod one more time to the mayors, Alorza and Grebbe, with whom we work so closely and are phenomenal. Um, and I want to thank the treasurer, Seth Magaziner, for being a great partner as well. We're going to hear from Tomas about all the things we're also doing in our administration. Thank you so very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. And, and next up, we are actually going to call up the general treasurer, Mr. Seth Magaziner. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you to all of my colleagues and
government who are here. A big thank you to Oscar and everyone from the Hispanic Chamber for your incredible efforts over the last decade, but especially over the last year and a half, uh, providing Rhode Island small businesses with much needed relief and counseling and support through the pandemic. And thank you to all of you for what you are doing to build Rhode Island's economy, to put people to work, and to improve our education and our quality of life. Uh, I was asked to speak tonight about the statewide school construction program, the progress that has been made to date, and what the future looks like. All of us are shared, are joined together in our goal to build a stronger economy for Rhode Island, a Rhode Island economy that is more broad-based, more equitable, more inclusive, and more resilient over the long term. At the end of the day, it is about providing paths to the American dream for every family in Rhode Island, regardless of zip code, regardless of race or origin. Everyone in Rhode Island deserves that shot at the American dream, the ability to put their kids in great schools and to see those kids get good jobs here in Rhode Island, not other states. That's why we do what we do. The statewide school construction program is central to that effort. Every child in Rhode Island deserves to go to a school that is safe and warm and dry and equipped for 21st century learning. Every child deserves that and every teacher, and I'm a former public school teacher myself, will tell you that the condition of a school building has a direct impact on the ability of teachers to teach and students to learn. So, a few years back, uh, when I was asked to co-chair the statewide school construction task force, uh, we had a big job ahead of us because the state had school buildings crumbling from north to south and east to west. And not only was it posing health and safety risks, fire code violations, schools that were not ADA compliant, schools with hazardous materials in the buildings, but the condition of those buildings was also having a direct impact on the ability of students to learn and teachers to teach. In East Providence, the largest high school, public high school in Rhode Island by enrollment, 1,600 students. There was one science lab for 1,600 students to share. Now, how are we going to attract high-tech companies to move to Rhode Island and expand in Rhode Island in the numbers that we want when you have kids graduating high school without ever seeing the inside of a science lab? Career and technical education is another great example. There are a lot of great careers available, and I, I don't need to tell you this, there are a lot of great careers available that don't require going to a four-year college and taking on that debt, but it requires good CTE programs at the high school level. And all over Rhode Island, there were lotteries and wait lists, students who wanted CTE programs, who wanted career and technical education, but couldn't get into the programs just because the facilities weren't large enough to accommodate the demand. And so when we talk about repairing school buildings, it's important not just because kids need to be safe, but because we need to set students up to be successful and to thrive in a 21st century economy. And so working with many of you in this room, back in 2018, we put out a plan, the voters approved it overwhelmingly, to make a once-in-a-generation investment, repairing school buildings all across the state of Rhode Island. And I'm pleased to report that just three years in, that program has already shown tremendous results. In just three years, we have allocated $1.4 billion to repair or completely replace 176 school buildings. That's a majority of the public school buildings in Rhode Island. And the program is still open and still receiving applications from school districts. So that number, that 176 number, is going to go up. But among just those 176 schools, those schools will serve nearly 100,000 students every year and will create more than 20,000 upfront jobs in the construction process. So far, the two communities that have received the most state funding by far to transform school buildings are Providence and Pawtucket, and I want to thank the mayors and the council members for <laughs> If anybody wants to see what a school of the future looks like, uh, go up the road here in Pawtucket and check out the Potter Burns Elementary School. I'm told that they have three architects. But that really is just the beginning. 
because over the next several years, all across Rhode Island, school buildings are going to be transformed, not only making them safer and more modern, but making them well equipped to teach students the lessons of the 21st century and train Rhode Island students for 21st century careers. Now that's the good news, but there's still work to be done. And one of the most important issues that we have to tackle, not just for school construction, but for all state construction projects, is making sure that all Rhode Islanders stand to benefit, and that who does the work is a question that is front and center. Because we're not doing this just to have nice things. We are doing this to put Rhode Islanders to work, and that means we need to increase the involvement of Rhode Island-based firms, Rhode Island-based contractors, and we need to live up to and go beyond the commitments that the state has made in employing women and minority-owned contractors. And I want to talk about that for just a minute. The rate of ME and WBE utilization in school projects has been better than for state projects over the last three years, but still not good enough. And one of the put changes that I am going to be pushing for is these, this goal that the state has of 10% utilization for MEs and WBEs, it's shameful that we haven't always met that goal, but also that is a ridiculously low goal. 10% not, not 10% for WBEs and 10% for MBEs, but 10% for both combined. And when you actually dig down into the data, the amount of work, both for state projects and beyond, that has actually gone to local Rhode Island-based minority-owned enterprises is low single digits. So, working with our legislative partners, we need to increase those goals, we should have separate goals for WBEs and MBEs, and there should be an enforcement mechanism, particularly with school projects. One of the things that we will be pushing for in the coming legislative session is increased funding to make sure that districts are incentivized to meet those goals. And again, we're starting from a very low base here, so we've got a lot of room to grow. Looking forward, the intention was always to do a second school construction bond, a second statewide school construction bond on the upcoming ballot. My hope and my expectation is that we will do that, and it will be an opportunity for us to not just continue the good work that is already being done, but to have a conversation about how we can take it to the next level. What are the priorities that should be included in school construction 2.0? I think we know some of them, MBE utilization, more of a focus on career and technical education spaces, more of a focus on early childhood education, which is hugely important, and lack of facilities is a barrier that we need to break through there. So I look forward to working with each of you in the coming months and beyond to take the progress that has been made on school construction in Rhode Island over the last few years and bring it to the next level. And do it not just for health and safety, not just for upfront construction jobs, though we like those a lot, but so that we can have an economic future in Rhode Island where every student graduates prepared to compete and to thrive in the 21st century economy. Together we can do this. We are capable of doing big things in Rhode Island. We're off to a great start in school construction, but there's much more work to do. And I'll close by saying this. We are here in Pawtucket, the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution, where Rhode Island became a hub for economic innovation. Don't let anyone tell you that we cannot be a leader again. Don't let anyone tell you that we cannot do big things, bold things, great things in Rhode Island. We can. And we can do it in a way that is broad-based and inclusive and gives everybody a shot to share in the spoils. That's what we need to come together and do. We have tremendous potential in Rhode Island. We have the culture, the location, the work ethic. We have tremendous human capital. We have tremendous anchor institutions. We just need to work together and set our goals high and ambitious in common pursuit of building that strong and secure economic future for everyone. So thank you all very much for being a part of this.
Thank you. Next, going off that, we are actually going to introduce the, uh, the host, the, the town is hosting us here tonight, the Tucket Mayor, Mr. Donald Brady. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, as you can tell, we do everything here very loud, proud, and with enthusiasm here in Pawtucket. So, thank you for being here. Um, and, and as we talk about our enthusiasm, I want to recognize some of the elected officials here. Um, you have Senator Sandra Cano, I saw Representative Zante, I saw Council uh, um, Cla Clovis Gregor, School Committee Member Jamie Chabonneau, Joanne Benolo, and Roberto Marino. Before I do, did I miss any of the Pawtucket elected officials? If not, the members of the Council of the School Committee the City, A, are excited that you're hosting the event here again. I'm going to thank you. But we are excited to be partners as we move forward and we talk about these things. So I want to congratulate my good friend Louis Toronto, my good friend Oscar Mejias, and the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce for this event. I want to thank, you know, you've heard, you've heard everybody. I'm going to do the political thing. I want to recognize the governor, the, the treasurer. I invited Mayor Laws to go over and told him that we're going to have a beer after this, so, you know, and he's got permission from the wife, and, and the Secretary of Congress, and our good friend Thomas. We're here because it's about you, it's about promoting what is happening in our community and how we band together and do those things. So as a host community, I'm glad you're here. I'm going to keep this short and I'm going to turn it back over. So thank you for all that you do. And I know there is a special recognition. We're going to leave one of the awards after because I don't want to spill it here as well. So we have a size issue. So thank you for your partnership and I look forward to the continued success together. Next, without further ado, the Mayor of Providence, Mr. Jorge Lorza. Buenos Aires. Good evening, everybody. Uh, congratulations to everybody. I add my voice to the chorus and you know, want to say congratulations to everyone and thank you for doing this work. I'm also going to be, I'm also going to be very, very brief. Uh, but I'm going to share with you a story that's, um, that brings this work close to home for me. And many of you have heard me talk about my mom, my mother. My mother, Aurora, is a, an immigrant from Guatemala, came here with nothing, but came here to work hard. She never called herself a business owner. She never thought of herself as an entrepreneur. But I want to tell you about my mom. She worked second shift. She'd get home every single night at about 2 o'clock in the morning. She'd wake up early, and the next day, she'd be up early. She ran a child care center in our second floor apartment on Cranston Street. On weekends, I would go with my mom to the flea market. We'd buy curtains and then drive around the neighborhood selling them. On Sundays, by my mother's side, we'd go around the neighborhood and we would pick up empty bottles and empty cans to take them to the recycling for the, for the, for the deposit money. Now, my mom never thought of herself as an entrepreneur, but my mom had it in her blood. Now, those were different times. There wasn't a Hispanic chamber that could have said, you have potential. You are a business owner. Let us help you grow. Let us connect you to resources that can help your business. But we have that here today, and that's why we're all here. The biggest piece of advice that I can give to anyone and everyone here is stay connected with the Hispanic Chamber. I also offer our services on behalf of the city. My small business development director is Victor Regina, habla espanol. Please make sure by the end of the night you can get his card. He's in the back of me wave, Victor. So please get to know Victor. And I want you to know that as long as I'm mayor here in the city of Providence, you have my full support. Some of the things that we've done in the past couple of years, you may or may not know this. We haven't had a single year where we have increased tax rates for our residents or businesses. That's the first time that it has happened since World War II. We've also eliminated the tangible taxes, the inventory tax, for 40% of businesses in the city of Providence, every single one of them small businesses. And I'm very proud to say, you know, a lot of folks talk about what we're going to do, what we can do, et cetera, and that's important, but I'm going to tell you what we have done. In 2020, in the city of Providence, I think it's the first time in history we not only met but we exceeded our WMBE goal. So we're working in partnership with all of our great organizations. And I'm excited about the work that's ahead. So thank you for being here. I wish you all the success. 
stay in touch and let us know how we can help. Thank you, Mayor Alorza. Next up, we have someone very special near and dear to this man, Chamber of Commerce. Uh, this gentleman was actually one of the founding board members for the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and he recently was promoted to the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Opportunity for the state. Without further ado, I'd like to call Mr. Tomas Avila. Thank you, and welcome everyone. I want, to, I want to start by introducing my teammate, Elvis Ruiz, who's on that table. I want to get set of five up. And my teammates, Dorinda, say hi, Dorinda, and Jim. If you are not certified as an MBEWB, visit uh, Dorinda, Jim, and Elvis. They are the ones who do it uh, for the state. And it's the only certification that the state does that allows you to do business with the state of Rhode Island. So take advantage of it. And uh, as I say, say, my name is Tomas Avila, and I have a couple stories to tell you, to share with you. And I start from the latest to the oldest. The treasurer mentioned enforcement that is needed, and it's true. But let me share <clears throat> what the governor told me when he appointed me to this position. Tomas is all about enforcement. Enforce the law because it's been there for 35 years and everybody knows it. And that's what I thought is enforce the law. When I walked in today, I was pleasantly surprised. Somebody said to me, Congratulations. And I said, Why? Because a general contractor told me that you are enforcing the law. And he knows because. He just went through it and things have changed. That is what the government wants and that is what I'm doing. It's a person. I'll give you another example. When, the, when I got appointed, the next day I was surprised by the governor in my office. And he said, I am here so you know that I'm behind everything and anything that you do, 100%. The next day, we had, he had a welcoming party for me with the Director of Purchasing and Human Resources. And it's because purchasing is the one who does the purchasing for the state. And they are the ones who deal with the contractors. And he was there to let it know that, excuse me, um, I have his support and they, they are to cooperate with me in the enforcement of the law. So I share those things with you because one of the things that I have always admired and respected about our governor is his intentionality. It's not about talking, it's not about bragging, but it's about intentionally changing society and humanity. And he has delegated that responsibility to me. The other part that I want to share with you, the treasurer spoke about $1.3 billion of school construction. And it is true. That's, it. That's there. But what I want to share with you, that the Department of Education for years refused to enforce the law. Bring this here, just be there longer than I have, and more than me not. They refuse to enforce it. And I decided that, you know what, this is a low hanging fruit. So last August, Doreen and I met with the Department of Education, and I said, I'm here to see how we can collaborate and how we can change going forward. Well, I am here to share with you that effective August 18th, the school board posted in their website and every document that is going to take place with this $1.3 billion that the law is being enforced. $1.3 billion is equivalent to about $103 million that we could have 
Then on top of that, we had another conversation. Let's talk with the governor and make it 20% instead of 10%. Those are facts. Those are not wishes. Those are not desires. Those are facts. And the reason I have been successful in two months to do that is because the governor has backed me 100%. So that's what I wanted to share with you. And the other thing that I want to share with you, and by the way, <coughs> congratulations to the um, school board. Back in 2013, is Senator Cano still here? Senator Cano called a group, Luis Torado, Jose Marcano, and she said to us, I need your help. We need to change the way Pawtucket does business, the way Pawtucket does purchasing. And I need your help to change that. She was in the school board at that time. We met with Mayor Brigham. We met with the superintendent at the time. We met with purchasing. We met with everybody. And out of that, came a better MBE, WBE initiative in the city of Pawtucket. All the schools that have been built and the success of the MBE, WBE is because of that friend of ours who called us to make changes. <laughs> so I'm sharing all of this with you because intentionality and the desire to change, just like the Senator did, it is possible. As long as we have willing mayors, willing governors to do change and to include those who have not been good in the past. So with that, congratulations to the Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for the invitation and the opportunity, and good night. So you may have uh, heard some sounds in the background. We actually have someone who's been waiting very patiently on Zoom for the past hour. Um, the little state of Rhode Island, we're, we're making some big moves, and we've actually connected uh, with Mr. Sergio Terreros. Sergio is the president of NAHICA, which is a National Hispanic Contractors Association. He really wanted to be here today, but he is tied up, I believe, in Houston right now. And he uh, agreed to, to join our meetings by listening in intently, and he's going to uh, say a couple words via Zoom.
Thank you so much, guys, for having me. Uh, my name is Sergio Torreros. I'm a president and co-founder of uh, NAHICA, the National Hispanic Contractors Association. As uh, you guys may know, I'm a first generation. I just came here and uh, I'm the first uh, the, the brought the border and the family. And, uh, and, uh, and then, you know, we, we start working in construction. That's why uh, Send to all you guys is that uh, we as an association uh, working uh, and have a conversation with Oscar. We're trying to get you guys in the big projects uh, in construction. Well, why are we doing this? Is because uh, in the association, uh, there, there, were, well, there was a survey uh, in 2020 by the American General Contractor Association, and they found out that most of the GCs, the general contractors, they're leaving, and they're not asking the companies to anyone else, they just retire. And uh, of course, uh, the new generation, the, the you know, younger generation, they just not joining the, the construction industry. And something that Mexica, uh, the, the World and the, the mission of Nahika is prepare general contractors, bring more general contractors to the construction industry. That's the sort of mission. And, my, and uh, when I was talking to Oscar, uh, he was mentioning you know, about all you guys, uh, all the members. You know, I was asking uh, about how we can collaborate. And I think you know you don't have a great potential to right now. I haven't been there. Hopefully, I can. Uh, I can go there. I think here are two stop over the weather. Uh, <laughs> and uh, but when things that like, for example, uh, something that we're doing in Texas right now, I'm in San, in San Diego. We have companies, uh, you know, offering uh, contracts for members, and uh, we negotiate here uh, on behalf of all you guys. Uh, but something that we look into is help you guys to take those big jobs, take those big contracts. We have guys that uh, are small companies that they just don't want to join the commercial construction industry or big projects uh, because they say they hear someone that didn't get paid or uh, they don't have the money or the language, okay? But we all have you know, solutions for that. And uh, we've seen a lot of stories here in the association where uh, guys without you know, language, you know, they don't speak English at all, uh, or they just sound like, sound like me, you know, accent. Uh, people that don't even know how a computer will uh, work uh, is making it. And it's because when we, when you guys as in Spanish, uh, as when you guys get together as an association or, or uh, chamber of commerce, uh, that, you know, we get stronger. That yeah, the information, the data is out there, and if we get, we can collaborate and we can uh, you know, provide information for you guys that have construction companies. So anyone to start. Uh, do you have construction companies and any, any contractors there in the audience? Yes? yes. Perfect. Yes. So if you guys work in residential and you guys, let's say, facing the problem you know, of not having money you know, to fund or fund the, the commercial big projects, we have the solution. We're going to be collaborating with uh, uh, the Chamber of Commerce of Rhode Island, the Spanish Chamber of uh, Chamber of Commerce of Rhode Island. To bring this mentorship, to bring this information to you guys, the information that helps is out there. Hopefully, we will meet uh, next time in person. But uh, this is what we're doing, and uh, to be honest, you know, we encourage you guys to take those big projects. That industry needs us. That industry needs the Spanish traffic because of this survey. It shows how there's going to be a huge gap. 
in the next 10 years, there's not going to be enough of those two companies if this funding is not taken. So the interesting thing is that we have the man manpower. Believe me, if you all have a cell phone, you guys are general contractors. Or the deal is Romero, the, the cousin is, is uh, Freimero, the, you know, the, the, the vecina, you know, knows about the roofing. So we are general contractors, but we need to know how to beat those big projects. So this is what we do, this is what we do in Ahiga. We uh, prepare, develop, and find contracts for uh, for members, and of course, collaboration with the Spanish Chamber of Commerce on Rhode Island. We want to try to take as well. So, as of me, Inglés, ya se me acabó. Ahí quedó. Pero a todas las personas que hablan español y que trabajan con mucho, nosotros les podemos ayudar. Les, eh, les, les reitero eh, que ustedes pueden eh, conseguir buenos contratos. Yo, como primera generación y con las primeras generaciones que, que, que trabajamos aquí en la asociación, este. Eh, Tratamos de, de, de darles todo, de, 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 de cómo, cómo negociar un contrato, cómo leer los planos, cómo dar los estimados, cómo, cómo trabajar o pedir un reconstrucción mini y, y todo lo que se necesita eh, aprender, eh, con las reglas. ¿no? Entonces, eso es lo que nosotros hacemos. Soy de Monterrey, Nuevo León, no sé si se notó. Y, este, eh, y pues saludos a todos. Este, uh, pues estamos aquí para ayudarles y, y ojalá y podamos vernos y ayudarles todos sus compañeros. ¿Alguna pregunta? ¿Alguna pregunta en el público? ¿Alguien quiere hacer una pregunta? Sí, vamos. Una pregunta. Vamos, vamos, vamos. Bueno, gracias. 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 Oh, thank you guys, thank you. Thank you so much for the information, that was great. My question. <laughs> Sorry about that. My question is in regards to what you said, how in the Latino community we do have a lot of soft skills and a lot of skills that um, people have developed since they come from different countries. So people, have, okay. people have developed a lot of different skills and like you say, like you know, one could be a plumber, the other one could be a landscaper, the other one could do the roof, right? Um, and we know each other and we just stay to what we do individually, right? So can you give us an advice of where you start so that all of these amazing people that have the skills and they're entrepreneurs can get together and maybe form a union to make sure that those general contracts uh, really go to the group of people and they could um, have like maybe a, um, a more buying power, right? Or like, you know, people see them as, as they, they're a, a power coalition or collaboration or cooperative, I, I'm not sure. I'm asking, based on your expertise, what would be the course that these people could take so that they could get access to projects that um, most likely they'll get together and uh, instead of being alone? Yes. Well, one thing that I can tell you is that all the people in the room, they are really doing the first step. That is, you know, get together, network with other people. Uh, and, uh, I've been building my companies and the association not by myself. It's a group of people. This is a movement. Okay? You can go uh, uh, fast, you know, by yourself, but if you want to go the wrong way, you have to take people with you. Okay? That's one thing. And the other thing is, yes, we all know about the Hispanic power, the Hispanic, but we all be talking about it. This time to, to make things happen. If you can get together, if you find the right people, and 
you can, uh, you know, you want to accomplish more, but now it's time to do the things. And that's something that we're doing, and it has worked for me. It's like wake up in the morning, you know, start making those calls. Uh, don't be afraid of making questions, knowing people, mentors, find mentors, people that are already uh, uh, have, you know, that have, you know, the path. Um, other thing that, that I can tell you is that yeah, if, even if we are, uh, you know, there's a lot of companies that I met and they say, yeah, I'm a contractor. But what happened is that they are not really a contractor. They're the, the labor. Just because you have a truck with, a, uh, with tools doesn't make you a contractor. You are labor. So what we need to do is get serious in business. Get serious in construction business. Okay, doing the work, putting a plywood or you know putting a, a painting on wall, that is okay. But what we want you guys to do and to start looking for is how construction business work in Miami, right? And for you guys, you have other, uh, if you have other uh, different professions, one thing working is really good. This basically one of the keys. People, you know, uh, want to help you guys. Like, you know, people, for example, we're meeting uh, here in San Diego, you know, other companies, and I have some of you guys have uh, companies there that are supporting the, uh, the, company, the Chamber of Commerce, ask questions, learn. We always want to do it, but we don't take too much time, you know, to learn that, that what is behind. So uh, that would be my answer, you know, uh, get together, network with people and uh, trying to uh, co connect more people and about big projects it's just because we don't have that, that information where to go see and uh, we are one of the source right to uh, uh, commercial or big projects uh, but you know product collaboration with you guys we can you know, bring some project or help to develop you know big projects because what happened is even if they give you a name you know, let's say, hey, you know what, uh, Mr. Sonso needs, uh, needs uh, to build a uh, family, right? Or needs uh, this kind of project. What happened is that we don't know how to build projects or how to communicate with them. And uh, we, we need to get them read and, uh, and, uh, and find mentors. Right? You know, one of my mentors is the first thing that told me, like, ask for help. People, People that is, that is more successful than, successful than us, most of the time they want to give you, you know, 10, 15 minutes of the time to teach you something. So, that would be my, my answer. Any other questions? I talk a lot, I don't know if it was the main one talking before. Gracias, Sergio. Apreciamos mucho tu participación y por, por supuesto que vamos a trabajar juntos para traer educación y para traer mejores maneras de trabajar a nuestros contratistas locales. Gracias y después conversamos. Claro que sí, Oscar. Gracias, Manuel. Nos vemos, muchachos. Pueden ser. First, I'm going to call up, or I guess all together, this hold your applause. We're going to have the chairman of the, uh, the, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Luis Dorado, the president of the chamber, Mr. Oscar Mejias, Senator San, San Lucano, Secretary of Commerce, Stephen Pryor, and also the Associate Director of ODO, Mr. Thomas Avila, for a special award. Thank you.
is the model for the state in minority participation in construction of school projects. And we are so proud because it shows that in our state, individuals still make a big difference, especially when they are in positions of leadership and you truly, honestly care about the minority community. So on behalf of, of the chamber and, 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 and all our, our minority community, thank you. We are extremely proud of you and we're really pleased to be able to recognize this today. Thank you. Chamber of Commerce in the Latino Contractor Summit Award presented to the City of Potocet School Committee in recognition for going above and beyond for the inclusion of minority businesses and women-owned enterprise with school construction projects on behalf of the Latino contractors present here and in the state. Thank you for your effort and we will promote you because you should be a model around the state. Thank you very much. the real leadership of these people here, um, which have a dance, listened, and done the things the right way to include minority participation, gives me a sense of pride. It makes me very happy. I brag all the time when I introduce legislation in um, the state uh, that my city is doing it and will continue to do it. And um, I want to just give a special recognition to um, the former chairman of the school committee, Jay Chavon. The reason why I'm giving him the special shout out is because it takes people like him that doesn't necessarily um, are from the Latino community or uh, like, you know, is, is from a diverse background um, to really believe in a vision, to really embrace policy, to move it forward and to take the leadership and say, we're gonna do the right thing and we're gonna do it far better than any other places and we're gonna make sure we not only comply, but we wanna make sure we enforce it, we're gonna be on top of it. And that is the reason why I'm giving him a, 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 a shout out because God knows how many times I call that man and he takes every single call, every single report we, we have gotten um, to review together, and he has done the work. And as the leader of the school committee, he, um, he's now a former leader, and that's what leaders do. Like, he really has stepped up the game, and he said, we're gonna do these, and we're gonna do the right thing, and he has done it. He has set the example, and now um, our vice chair of the school committee, Roberto Moreno, which is a Latino of our own, um, but also the chairperson of the facilities committee, have taken that basis that have been strong and have led with passion, intentionality, we've been talking about intentionality all night, and so we are very, very proud. And Joanne, I would say, you started with me in 2013 and you continue like the support. So we just wanna say thank you to the school committee, Pataki Proud, and on behalf of the Senate, we have a citation for all of you. So congratulations. <laughs>